Gosh. Guess I should have made a video. Before we get to the video in earnest, fellas, you probably got a few questions for yourself, and I got a few questions for myself, too. First question you probably have is, why now? Why in March, of all things? And the answer is, is that, man, goddammit, it took me way too damn long to make this video. To put in perspective, see these, this, this 45 pages of nonsense. <laughs> so, yeah, that's part of the reason why it took so long. The other part is, is that, like, God damn, it just took a long time to get here. I've just been busy doing things, doing whatever. So, it's not a good answer, but hey, I'm gonna do this video anyways, because god damn, look how much time I spent doing this. So, better late than never, as I would say. Second question that you don't know now, but you're gonna know later on in the video, is that why is this video so messed up? Probably wondering to yourself if you're a manlet, and you're thinking, Tom, how did you grow a full beard within 15 seconds? The answer is, <laughs> yeah, I did it. The answer is, is that this part of the video was shot like two weeks after that other parts of the video were shot. And then those videos, there was a separate part that was shot another two weeks before that, when I had a full beard. So, this is kind of the introduction part because, oh man, oops, something, something messed up in the video. <laughs> yeah. So I gotta reshoot this part and the first number on my list. To start off with, if my voice sounds a little different than normal, well that's because I kinda have a little cold here. <laughs> but anyway, let's get on with the video. Of course, we're not just going to start off with the games that I'm going to be putting on this list, and I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory and horrible exposition to all you poor fools who subscribe to me. 2018 has been a pretty busy year for me in some of the best and worst ways. To start off, I got a new job that has jump-started my second phase of my career and has given me both the ability to live comfortably by doing the things that I want to do and buying the stuff I need to buy, of which is a new video camera and lens which you've seen in the last video and with the use of this video. Alternatively, the fact that I took the time off from reviewing and video making to get this newfound skill and job has left me with little time to make videos. Hence why the last two videos of yesteryear came out in October of all months and came about being tired of not making anything. Another part of the story is that for the most part, the vast majority of my enjoyment with the games that came out in 2018 came out in the last four or so months, with a few games on this list coming out in December or being played in my catch-up month in January. It also doesn't help that 2018 was a much more mellow year compared to 2017, just as 2008 was mellower compared to 2007. I feel a lot of developers of the stuff I really enjoy blew their load in 2017, and 2018 was a sort of a catch-up year to take a goddamn break. But luckily, it doesn't mean that 2018 wasn't without a few great games. Granted, there's nothing on here that reaches near Automata levels, we still got some great games to play and some great surprises to be had. So now before we start the actual list of my top 10 games of 2018, just know that every game on this list is my own personal pick and is honestly my opinion. So if you don't feel like that's a good answer to some of the games on this list, or your favorite game wasn't on this list, I would go over to the fridge, grab yourself a nice cold glass of chocolate soylent go back to playing smash bros ultimate because this is my list god damn it and here we go this is the top 10 You ever wonder to yourself, hey, why doesn't anybody make a classic Castlevania experience? And I'm not talking about these Metroidvania games that come out where you can go everywhere. I'm talking about a classic like Castlevania 1 through 4 experience. You know, you fight ghoulies, it's a linear run through, things like that. Well, the answer is, is that you're probably not because only an insane person like myself would want something like that and everybody else wants a the normal Metroidvania games. But, if you are somebody like me, then goddamn, you gotta watch out for Bloodstain, Curse of the Moon. Curse of the Moon is an interesting tale of a game since it's not really a planned game at all, but a stretch goal of Koji Igarashi's latest project, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. 
which is his Kickstarter-led campaign to create a spiritual successor to Castlevania Symphony of the Night, the one game that everybody loves. As stated, Curse of the Moon was one of the stretch goals for Ritual of the Night, which is basically a game to hold people over before the eventual release of the main game. The developers would create a small prequel game that, like how Ritual of the Night was a spiritual successor to Symphony of the Night, Curse of the Moon was going to be a spiritual successor to the older Castlevanias that I personally love so much. In Curse of the Moon, you star as Zengetsu, a demon hunter haunted by visions of nefarious demonic entities that you have pledged your life and your blood to destroy. So now that one of the big demon baddies has been resurrected, you grab your trusty sword and whip to set out into this cursed realm and hunt these demon bastards down. And that's pretty much it for the story for Curse of the Moon. There's really not much to be said here, but I'll explain it a little bit later. For right now, let's talk about the gameplay. Curse of the Moon could basically be described from the get-go as the classic Castlevania game that never was, somehow lost to time in the Konami archives only to be resurrected through Koji Igarashi's Dark Sorcery. It's got all the hallmarks of a classic Castlevania adventure with all the typical enemies such as ghouls, skeletons, medusa heads, and many more, but it really takes a lot of its gameplay hallmarks from Castlevania 3, Dracula's Curse. And in Dracula's Curse, you didn't just play as Trevor Belmont, the main protagonist, but as well as a slew of other characters, ranging from the vampire Alucard and Sypha the Priestess. Each of these characters provided different abilities when it came to gameplay. For example, Grant the Hunchback is a lot quicker than Trevor so he can scale the walls of Castle Dracula, and move much faster while Sypha can cast elemental spells to destroy all the ghoulies in your way. And this same mechanic finds its way to Curse of the Moon with a small but significant tweak. In Curse of the Moon, each one of your characters essentially constitutes part of a life. So to deplete one of your lives, so to speak, you have to die as all of your current characters. So when you start off as Zengetsu, you effectively only have one life, and if you die in that map, then that life is gone. But that changes when you recruit Miriam, which is basically Sypha in this game, into your retinue, which effectively doubles the amount of times you can die in a map without going through a life. It's one of those small changes that while seemingly it does very little, it actually brings a lot of nuance to the game that I didn't quite expect. Over the course of the game, the characters you play as are Zengetsu, the punished demon hunter who hails from the country in the Far East, Miriam, the crystal-laden maiden whose demonic powers lie embedded in the crystals, and not to mention, is the protagonist of the full game, Ritual of the Night. From the remainders are Alfred, the skilled, aged alchemist who shoots powerful spells and repels attacks, also acting as a father figure to Miriam. And finally we have Gabel, the pretty boy crystal bat fiend whoever who uses a legion of bats for most of his attacks, and can turn into a bat himself, reaching areas that the others cannot with relative ease. Gabel, for some reason or another, also serves as the main antagonist for Ritual of the Night, which is the full game that's going to be coming out soon. Now, don't really know how it gets to being the villain from being your friend in this game, but if I had to take a guess, he goes a little whoopy, a little cuckoo. Well, to keep going with the gameplay, it's not much different from the original games at first glance. You got your enemies walking about and you hit them with various weapons, whether they be Zengetsu's sword, Miriam's better whip, Alfred's magic, or Gabelle's ew, nasty bats. The enemies come in many shapes and sizes, ranging from smaller skeletons and ghoulies to larger demonic entities like a possessed mech and a giant two-headed dragon surrounded with mean-looking teeth. Most of these enemies, including the bosses, aren't too terribly interesting to face themselves, but they all tend to represent interesting choices at the player's disposal and how they choose to take him down. For instance, you could go in with Zengetsu and try to kill a mech by whittling down its health, or alternatively, you could just use Alfred to freeze the machine and simply shatter it, causing no harm to yourself or the others. If I did have one minor gripe, is that a little too often the obvious solution was to switch to Alfred, since he's a bit more overpowered from the rest of the crew, but yeah, it's kind of a minor grievance. But you may ask yourselves, fellas, what's the presentation like? Is it good? Is it bad? And really, to be honest, fellas, I gotta say, it's beautifully, wonderfully classic in its aesthetic. Man, like I've mentioned before, Curse of the Moon feels like a game from 20 years ago and that was ripped from the hands of Konami, probably by some hell portal that it originated from antediluvian Finland. 
sounds and looks near identically as it used to back in the day, but it does have some modern improvements such as much more complex and detailed sprite work on a lot of the models and environments. And my personal favorite, a more complex composition of the classic chiptune tracks. While there isn't really much that changes over the course of 20 years, it's still wonderful to see that artesian-like sprite work and sound be presented on modern, crisp hardware. Ultimately, I had a lot of fun with Curse of the Moon. Sure, it's not very complex or very long, but honestly, it's kind of a stretch goal for a much longer game, and really, you don't need a long game to make you have a good impression. And that's what you're going to get with this game, a wonderful great impression of a classic Castlevania game, with Bloodstained, Curse of the Moon. Now our next game, Gris, from Nomada Studios from Barcelona, Spain, is kind of a special case. Uh, it's a special case because it's only three or four hours long, and you can't really tell too much about it because, well, you'll spoil it. The thing is, too, is that this is one of those games where you kind of want to go into it blind. Gree is an atmospheric exploration game that is comparable to Journey or Flower. You don't really have any enemies to fight and the vast majority of the game you're there to take in the sights and let the game speak for itself. In the game you play the titular Gree, who from what I gather went through some traumatic event. After that it's up to you to pick up the pieces and figure out how to continue living with yourself and accept what's happened. At least that's what I gathered from the premise for the game. There's no dialogue in the entire game whatsoever, so the actual on-screen presentation is left to tell the story for Gree. And holy hell, fellas, the presentation for Gree is absolutely out of this damn world. And it has to be, because really, there's no dialogue in the entire game. The only things that are there to present the story to you are the catalysts of the presentation and its visuals and in the soundtrack. To start off, we'll talk about the visuals of Gree, which are the mind child of Russian-Japanese artist Ilya Kushinov, which seems to be his debut into the foray of video games, at least as an art director. Unfortunately, there isn't much of him to describe, as it seems he would like his work to be the main focus of his, well, you, you know, work. Though while Ilya doesn't like to say much about himself, his art on the other hand has a lot to say and while it may sound cliche, I honestly think there isn't anything else out there that even remotely looks similar to Ilya's art. He's genuinely a one of a kind. One aspect of his art that I really catch immediately as different from the rest is that Ilya uses cinema techniques in his compositions. By using dreamlike lighting and cinematic staging of scenes and characters that make the art come off as not as a singular piece of art but almost like a screen cap from an extended media. But as for how it works with Gree, you really have to see it in action because me just giving you this lecture to you trying to describe it isn't going to do it any justice. His art shapes everything in Gree, from the sharp outlines and the fantastic use of rectangles, and the golden ratio for not just individual objects and characters, but also in developing the larger set pieces. How the camera and some of these set pieces pull back to show Gree perfectly in the middle and genuine harmony with the visuals of the game is a feeling that's hard to describe apart from ultimately pleasing. To compare it to another visually wonderful game, it reminds me a lot of my favorite game of 2017, Near Automata, in the sections where the camera pulls back to show the larger area and make you feel so oppressively small yet important in the grander shot. Something that's truly an artesian piece. But of course, since this is the Tom the Chosen One Empire, we do of course gotta dabble in the soundtrack of Gree. So, a new addition that I'm going to do in this year's list is basically where you can go to find the soundtrack. 
Now, not every game on this list is going to be put on the description because, well, some of the soundtracks on this list are not something super spectacular, but the soundtrack done for Gree by Berlinist is absolutely wonderful, and the Bandcamp link is going to be down in the description. The incredible soundtrack for Gree comes from Barcelona-based alternative and chamber pop group Berlinist. Known for their prominent use of violin and other string arrangements and their very chill works. For the Grease soundtrack, they throw in some neat curveballs, mainly the use of ethereal vocals for some of the theme tracks, and my personal favorite, a touch of synth throughout the whole soundtrack to really nail that solemn, otherworldly feel. The synths are really a great addition. They work hand in hand with the strings to start off with these smaller, more personal tracks, and then they swell into these large, sweeping epics that make you feel moments of rising hope and also moments of crushing despair. Then it usually ends with a return to the solemn piano, bringing you back into this lonely yet profoundly beautiful world. So fellas, I'm gonna have to recommend this game on probably a sale since it's so short, and while it is wonderfully beautiful and so profound in its presentation, it's three to four hours long, so rather than it's on a sale, but hey, if you got the money, go grab yourself a nice good old copy of Gree. Once upon a time, there was a world torn by endless war, and peace was a distant dream. But then came a great king, one who would change this world forever. Petty Whisker Tildrum, King of Ding Dong Dell, Gods, seize him! We have to leave. There you are, Your Majesty. I'm afraid I must ask you to relinquish your life. You are the kingdom's last hope ever. You cannot die. Do you want a game that has the story of regicide, an ancient master rising up to avenge his fallen kingdom, and the rise of a young lad who learns to become a king? Then, of course, Nino Kuni 2 The Revenant Kingdom has everything all tied up in one beautiful package. Nino Kuni 2 is developed by the fantastic folks over at Level 5 Inc., known for producing such series as Professor Layton, Dark Cloud, and of course, you know, the first Nino Kuni. Nino Kuni 2, as far as can be described from the get go, is another classic Japanese RPG romp through a fantasy world that's delightfully colorful in the fact that the aesthetic of the game shares similarities with Studio Ghibli films. You play the role of Evan Pennywhisker Tildrum, a young boy who became the monarch of a nation after his late father passed away from regicide and is left to pick up the pieces. Of course, not too long after this event, Rowan, a man from what is basically our world, gets teleported in after surviving a goddamn nuclear attack and helps Evan escape from the clutches of Mausinger, a rat-faced fiend that ends up usurping the throne. After some plot and heartfelt goodbyes, Evan is left with the task of carrying out his vision of a world where there is no conflict and everyone can live happily ever after, or so you're told numerous times. So armed with trusty companions and a righteous cause, Evan embarks on a fantastic quest through this imaginative world. And yeah, the story does seem kind of simplistic by this channel's standards, but we're going to take a look at it a bit after because it has some genuinely nice surprises. But of course, let's take a look at the gameplay. To put it simply, everything you do in this game is all for the building and betterment of your own kingdom, and improving it includes fighting in combat, doing quests, upgrading the kingdom, and ultimately upgrading the military. 
Basically, it's a well-oiled machine because we need to do quests out in the overworld and in several other kingdoms to get what are called citizens. These citizens, in turn, join your kingdom to start working at one of the many different facilities that are available. These facilities can produce natural resources for your kingdom, upgrade your magics for more powerful spells, upgrading and crafting various pieces of equipment, and of course, the barracks to improve the kingdom's military. These improvements in turn help you by increasing your combat ability so you can progress through the story to new chapters and new sites, and eventually unlock new citizens, like that one Jewish concubine. Upgrading your citizens and of course recruiting new mercs for Outer Heaven improves your military, which in turn helps you win battles on the strategic map that are part of the main quest. It's an aspect of Nino Kuni 2 that I think it does way better than a lot of its competitors. A lot of JRPGs out there, they kind of make you do a bunch of dumb, ass, stupid, busy work, but every single system in Nino Kuni 2 is wonderfully interconnected with each other. But of course, all these wonderful, interesting, interconnected concepts are there to propel the story forward. And really, good old Nino Kuni 2 has a bunch of wonderful, nice surprises. To elaborate, there are interesting concepts of Imperium, duty to one's kingdom, duty to one's people, and the conflict that can arise when one is put forth more than the other or skewed to a level where it can cause everybody harm. Without spoiling it, every kingdom we find in this game has a conflict that deals with one of these concepts. Whether it be overworking a populace to exhaustion in order to create a technology that can change the world into a post-scarcity state, or prohibiting love within the kingdom in order to keep its population from rising. There's something that strikes a chord in the sense that the monarchs or tyrants you meet aren't doing something evil just for the hell of it, they do it for the greater good or some grander goal that they can benefit from, and they've come to terms that they might have to use conflict to achieve their dreams. Hell, even the main villain of the game has goals that make him in the end sympathetic, as he does the nefarious things that he does because of his loyalty to his people. When you get to the final sequences in the game, you're going to have a wonderful surprise in your hands because the motives of the main villain are actually really sympathetic. And even though this game seems rather simplistic, it's nice and surprising that the villain isn't just Urk, I'm bad and I gotta go kill the other heroes. To stray away from the heavy hitting themes of Nino Kuni, we also got to talk about the subtle but nice development that it gives our MC Evan along the way. It really is something when we go from the beginning of the game where we have Evan clinging to Roland all the time and he's always unsure with himself, to near the end of the game where he truly takes up the mantle of responsibility and becomes a fantastic monarch to be praised. Though I will say that I'm kinda disappointed in a lot of the other side characters that don't seem to have too much development. Sure, we get to see the backstories of some of the later side characters that lead to some interesting revelations, but for the most part they are never really as fleshed out as the villains or Evan or Roland. As stated, the only other character that gets a lot of prominence would be Roland, who could be described as our second protagonist, especially when he takes charge and gets a chapter that deals exclusively with him. Now while I wouldn't say that he gets a lot of development, he's a good character that helps to show Evan on his journey and in growing into a fantastic monarch for the world. But let's leave some story aspects for now, since of course, it's just a list and we don't want to spoil everything, but let's talk about this game's wonderfully charming presentation. First thing you can probably notice about Nino Kuni 2 is its distinct art style that I earlier said is taking inspiration from Studio Ghibli films, and in that aspect the models and the designs for the characters are fantastic, completely and absolutely filled with character. You can look at characters like Tani, Bracken, and the citizens of the various kingdoms, and you can find a slew of characters that in their simplicity look nothing like the competition. Though I do wish that the style for the environment got the same love since apart from Hydropolis, most of the locales look a little ee, too generic. Luckily though, the soundtrack does provide a bit more charm to make up for the environments. Now while not every single track in this soundtrack is going to win an award of some sort, a completely serviceable soundtrack with its moments is just as dandy. I do want to say that most of the tracks that I will highlight seem to have some melancholic or lofty undertones to them. They're more laid back than a lot of the other tracks and I think personally this is where composer Joe Hisaishi really excels. 
The soundtracks for areas like Capstown Upon Stall and Hydropolis that seem both peaceful yet a little melancholic really highlight how bittersweet the stories for a few of the quests in these two towns are. While it's not something that I would buy or really recommend much apart from someone who's played through the game, but the soundtrack is serviceable and is really there to complement the already beautiful looking aesthetic. Ultimately, the romp through Nino Kuni 2 is a very enjoyable one. And this is probably going to be the first game on this list that goes into feature length territory because man, you're going to get every penny's worth out of this game just in gameplay hours alone. But that's not the only thing. You're going to get and see some wonderful surprises along the way that are going to make you go, man, this E-rated game sure got me. So if you're looking for a wonderful game that's a JRPG, look no further than of course, Nino Kuni 2. I'm going to build a kingdom where everyone can live happily ever after. Ready for this? is doomed. I won't run away. <laughs> Not again. Not ever. You finally arrived. Finally, a game comes around to give me that wonderful niche hillbilly core horror sort of aesthetic after the disappointing Outlast 2 came out and kind of, well, disappointed me. But if that incredibly inflammatory statement didn't make you want to leave right out the window, then come on my friend, take a seat because we're going to take a look at Dusk. See, now the only real way I can describe Dune is, like, get this, you get a blender, right? You're gonna put ingredients in it like Doom, Rob Zombie's Hellbilly Deluxe, a little sprinkling of Hexen, and probably a little bit of speed, and then have that blender be controlled by, uh, I don't know, insane Polax? In the end, the product you're gonna get is fast as hell, bloody as hell, and thanks to the wonderful soundtrack done by Andrew Holschult, metal as hell. Not counting the literal metal as all hell of Doom. In Dusk, you obviously play the role of Dusk Dude, whose only known backstory is being tall, having a beard, a mean old hat, and a trench coat, and you start the game strapped to meat hooks, which sounds like a whole lot of ouch until you claim revenge on your hellbilly cultists by gutting them with the game's signature sickles. From there on, you go from a wacky locale to another wacky locale to find a variety of evils in your quest to defeat the greater evil surrounding the spooky town of Dusk, Pennsylvania. Total population of 666, because, well, of course. That's pretty much it for the premise, and really, man, that's all you need. So, let's go on and talk about the badass gameplay. Dusk from the get-go basically parades itself as a shooter from the 90s, and just oozes it out of every wonderful pore. From starting up the game with fake DOS version 666, the simplistic menu that's very reminiscent of Doom, and even changing the pixelation to various different modes ranging from the default 2 times pixelation to 5 times pixelation which is referred to as Summer of 94. For the game you get the classic options of the campaign and the new endless mode, which is a mode where you have to survive for as long as you can through an endless amount of enemies, hence, well, you know, the name endless mode. The campaign is then split into three episodes, those being the Hellbilly-tastic foothills, the nefarious machinations of the Merchant's Guild and their military deem-industrial military complex, and finally capping it off with the of the nameless city. It's honestly such a classic three episode combo that the only way they could have made this even more classic is if they bundled the first episode as shareware. 
just like the first Doom. The episodic nature of the game is there to give you the same dinner meal of dusk, but with completely different and crazy variations of the recipe. For instance, the foothills has wide sweeping areas so you can get accustomed to the game's very many retro mechanics, prime of which is your most powerful weapon and method of defense, that being speed. From the get-go, you're going to learn to start bunny hopping across the stages to gain momentum to get away from your enemy's projectiles, which are large, visible, and with a little bit of practice and some skill, sorry Polygon, easily dodgeable. You'll also get accustomed to the game's weapons except for a select few that can only be found in later episodes, but the levels of the foothills give you ample room to play around and experiment with the weapons at hand, whether it be dual lever action shotguns or the crossbow that can impale several enemies at a time. Likewise, your enemies will have simpler, more easily dodgeable attacks so you get used to the pattern of constantly moving while shooting your enemies. But you're gonna need that first episode to work up your skills because the next two episodes, <laughs> oh boy, they're gonna test your might. Without spoiling too much, the facilities are gonna take everything you know and give you tighter, smaller maps, faster and more abundant enemies that shoot stronger and faster projectiles, and some bosses that are just downright sadistic. A perfect fit for this cult. The locale will also change over to one of the demonic industrial complex, filled with infernal machines that grind up sacrificial meat, labs that experiment eldritch creatures, and reactors that fuel hell portals to locales beyond your own imagining. From here on out, if playing on the proper difficulty, be prepared to die. Yeah, a lot. Because these new areas will be there to test your reflexes, your finesse, and eventually, if you keep dying, your own goddamn patience. One of my favorite highlights of the facilities is a level called the Erebus Reactor, where immediately you're given one of the largest areas you've played in the game with way too many damn enemies, and all the tools at your disposal to take them out however you like. It's exhilarating to be zooming all over the map, taking pot shots at the mamas here and there, trying to lob rockets at you from the other end of the map. It's truly a map where the goal is to never stop moving and never stop shooting the evil demonic industrial complex goons in your way. Finally, there's the nameless city that I won't say much at all because it would honestly be awful of me to spoil such wonderful surprises this episode has in store for you. Just know that some of the toughest fights and the most ball-to-the-wall moments happen in the name Nameless city as you travel from crazy locale to the next. Be prepared to speak the mantra of ashes to ashes, dusk to dusk. And of course, we gotta give a shout out to our boy Andrew Holschult who composed the soundtrack because without him, man, that game would not be as fun as it is today. You know the composer does a fantastic job when some of your levels of your speed-based, metal-driven, first-person shooters start to feel like a horror game. While not trying to demean Hulkschild, a lot of the music in Dust can be compared similarly to games like 2016's Doom, but it's astounding how the soundtrack can be produced on a much smaller budget but somehow be just as wonderful and just as creative. You got a soundtrack that goes from some sinister atmospheric tracks and make great use of the synthesizer, slowly ramping up to the righteous riffs and hearty chugs whenever the action gets ramped up. It's funny how nowadays it seems like such a simple and almost predictable thing to expect when enemies are going to appear and the music is going to get way nastier, but man I love it every single damn time, it honestly never gets old. And that's honestly the hallmark of a great composer for these kind of games. It didn't matter how many times I died and I had to redo the level again, with the same kind of music it kept me pumping and going to beat up the hell out of these cultist goons. You can also find a link to Andrew Holschult's Bandcamp page in the description, there you'll find where to purchase the soundtrack for Dusk. Hey, so that's Dusk for you. if you're looking for a hardcore, fast paced heavy metal inspired hellbilly core deluxe sort of like fast first person shooter, then of course, don't look any further than good old Dusk, Pennsylvania population 666. What?
Fellas, you ever wonder what it would look like if I added a game this far into the list purely because of the soundtrack? Well, you're gonna get that with Persona 3 and Persona 5 Dancing, sharing the stage together at number 6. Way back in 2015, we got ourselves a weird little Persona game that not too many people were expecting, and that was of course Persona 4 Dancing All Night, a rhythm game spin-off of Persona 4 which to this day I still think is the most popular of the three newer Persona games. It came on the scene and I was like yeah okay sure, I guess if they made Persona 4 fighting game and a Persona 3 and 4 dungeon crawler like Etrian Odyssey, then I shouldn't be too surprised that they made a rhythm game of sorts. So you put the game into the damn PlayStation Vita, since that was the only platform on it at the time, booted it up and get blown away at the moment of effort that went into remixing and remastering the entirety of Persona 4 and Persona 4 Golden soundtrack. I won't lie in saying that I was immediately hooked on this latest Japanese ploy to deprive me of my money, because the Persona 4 soundtrack is the catchiest of the three games and blending it together with a guilty pleasure of mine in rhythm games was honestly a match made in heaven. So when they announced in 2017 that they were making not just a Persona 3 dancing game, but also a Persona 5 dancing game, I had a little bit of fervor, because of course, all I could think of was how they were taking me away from this. Cause this is all you care about is goddamn money! Now Persona 3 and Persona 5 Dancing is basically more of the same old same old with a much larger expanded soundtrack that now spans the soundtrack of Persona 3 FES, Persona 3 Portable, Persona Q, and Persona 5. The games has basically two real options to choose from in the menu, those being dancing and social links which sort of mirror the story related hangout events that you experience in the main game which replaces the story mode from Persona 4 Dancing All Night. Now I usually would be upset that they kind of removed a feature as large as a story mode in a game, but to be honest fellas, the story mode in Persona 4 Dancing wasn't really that good. The visual novel format with sparse rhythm game gameplay sprinkled throughout it didn't really do it for me. In turn with social links we get these little goofy events of each character doing their own thing within the dance inspired dreamscape created by Elizabeth and Justine and Caroline, the velvet room attendants in Persona 3 and Persona 5 respectively. Turns out all the dancing is done as some sort of sisterly feud between the attendants since realizing that Margaret, the attendant of Persona 4 had considerable success with that cast by having them dance their feelings or I don't know something. It's basically like slam poetry but less you know like hernia inducing, especially since the tunes are done to a wonderful boppin' soundtrack. So that leads us to the actual game portion of it, and you're probably wondering, eh, well, what of it? Is it any good? Does it suck ass? And well, I'm here to answer the fact that it's some nice, tight as hell gameplay. Like most rhythm games, you gotta hit the notes which are displayed as the different buttons on the PlayStation controllers at the right time. Hit a note perfectly and you'll get a higher score, hit it a little off and you'll get a lesser score, hit it with a good or completely miss the note and you'll lose your streak, which is gonna make a very mad Tom. From these notes there's going to be a variety of different formats the notes are going to come in. Some expect you to hit them rapidly in sequence, some expect you to hold a note for a longer period of time, and some expect you to hit two notes at the same time, with some throwing at you a record scratch that you get to do with a quick flick of the sticks. Now of course it doesn't seem that complex, but with the higher difficulty comes more complex patterns and speed, but you're going to get higher scores and eventually you're going to unlock more songs the more you complete. And believe me fellas, you're going to want to unlock as many tracks as you can in this game because they're all wonderful. And that leads me to this game's presentation which is so beautifully wonderful and I just love every single bit of it. I am talking of course about these games' presentation and everything from the models doing the dancing to the tunes that are coming from your fantastic speakers are absolutely top notch. To start with the models, the game uses a different engine that gives us a much higher resolution and more detailed model of the Persona characters that we all know and love. And some of these models absolutely blow my mind, and the ones in particular are the Persona 3 models, because it's going from where we last saw them looking like this. No different than the rest of the ones we've seen. But that fits logically, which means the Abyss's origin, the reason for the time skips, is here. With LP, I have tons of questions to ask. 
So you're the one who chose the locations of our stages, right, LP? Exactly. That's right, that's right. No time to waste. I select the location with Absolutely my... Absolutely incredible. And honestly, it leaves me speechless every time I look at this damn game. But for a soundtrack guy like me... This is gonna be the thing that turns the normal Tom into the big galaxy brain Tom. Because man, oh man, these two games, is their soundtracks are just out of this world. At the base level, the soundtrack we got to choose from is woo -woo, expansive as all hell since it encompasses well over four games. What this provides for us is some of the best damn remixes to the tracks we've loved for well over a decade now, or a little over two years if you're counting Persona 5. From the moment you boot up the game, you get the opening cutscenes for both games and you're already greeted with instant classics. Particularly with our moment, which is the opening for Persona 3 dancing, a whole exciting and heart pumping intro to the game that's going to give you a whole lot of enjoyment. Some of my other favorites come in the Daisuke Asakura remix for The Battle for Everyone's Souls, which is the final boss theme of Persona 3. But it starts off with these hard synths and that longing piano only to explode into a disgustingly addicting Europop-like fury. All the meanwhile, the cast of Persona 3 are doing goddamn dances in the Velvet Room attendant clothes. My favorite moment is probably when Junpei looks longingly at the audience, and man, it's just maximum cheese. Alrighty, and while we're at it, we should probably give Persona 5 some love, and one of the better remixes that I love a lot is Fatless Kazuka's remix of Tokyo Daylight. That almost kind of sounds if you got Night Temple or Desired or any other of the future funk artists to do a remix of a Persona 5 song, which man, ugh, now that I think about it, I didn't even know I want that. It starts off with a groovy bass line and never really lets off. Then it throws in the wonderful vocals by Lin and Aizumi, taking you through most of the song until it hits this wonderful section where they mess with the synths for a bit and it's just, ooh boy. <laughs> As for the visuals, you get to see goofy ass Morgana do a groovy dance while Haru and her disgusting forehead comes in during the fever moments to lend him a hand, doing all the weird dancing. It's goofy dumb fun and I love it for it. So to wrap up this little section in a nice neat little bow, if you like both Persona and rhythm games. This game is right up your alley, but if you don't like either of them, then I, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with you. Go, go play them, I guess. Now, fellas, I'm gonna let you in. Apparently, there's a rumor coming around that we're gonna get a Persona 3 remake in the same engine as these games. And I'm telling you, if that happens, man, you only left me with $21. And you know what? This is all you care about. This is all Fatless cares about. Goddamn money. No need to hold back anymore. What are you waiting for? It's not a curse. With five feeble senses, we pretend to comprehend the boundlessly complex cosmos. Well, fellas, we made it exactly halfway through this damn list, and we're at the number five spot. And, ugh, yikes. If you're wondering, man, this is a long video. Well, it's going to be a long video, but please bear with me, because the game that made it exactly halfway through this list is none other than Call of Cthulhu by Cyanide Studios. 
All right, fellas, I'm gonna be a little real with you here, and I'm not gonna talk too much about this one on the list because I can't really say too much without either A, spoiling it, or B, elaborating endlessly on how much I love the tabletop game of the same name. So to keep it simple, Call of Cthulhu is a tabletop pen and paper RPG that takes place in the eponymous Cthulhu Mythos, created by one HP Lovecraft and his cat who has a name that I can't really say because, well, this channel will get demonetized in an instant. For the most part, the setting of the Mythos takes place in the 1920s New England where the player characters live and work. Unless you're some weirdo that wants to give the GM a hard time and oh boy, don't do that because I'm gonna have you shot. Instead of being warriors, thieves, or wisms, we take the role of ex-Great War soldiers, Talmudic bankers, and occult anthropologists, so basically, warriors, thieves, and wisms. In this setting, we usually have some sort of event that propels our story forward to come into contact with the occult and otherworldly eldritch forces that test our sanity. Usually at the end of these campaigns in the tabletop game, our player characters are usually dead, insane, or trapped in some sort of interdimensional time hell, never to return. Because if there ever is one thing to learn about the Cthulhu Mythos is that you never really win or defeat the enemy. Just halt the inevitable for a little while longer, usually at the cost of serious bodily or mental harm. So our game in question today is the first real attempt of trying to get the RPG mechanics from the tabletop game into a video game form, and how does it fare? Well, honestly it did a lot better than Dark Corners of the Earth did. In Call of Cthulhu proper, we play the role of one Edward Pierce, whose task would investigating the mysterious deaths of a family in the remote, decrepit island of dark water, off the coast of Massachusetts. And right from the get-go, like any Cthulhu mythos tale, everything is not as it seems in the xenophobic town. As mysterious happenings, rude introductions from the locals, and secret societies are the norm around here, and you have to get to the bottom of it before you end up getting to the bottom of the next bottle of Prohibition whiskey. From there, the game opens up to be a purely adventure, investigative driven game. And let me repeat that for you. A purely adventure, investigative driven game. That means there's almost no combat except for one section of the game and it gives you free reign across sections of the island to figure out the mystery at your own pace. Now of course, there is a caveat to this and that is the fact that the game for the most part is mostly pretty linear. But I am willing to let that go for the fact that we even got a Cthulhu Mythos game of this caliber at all. So this is where my recommendation for this game goes a little awry because honestly, this game's a little rough around the edges. There's no shame in honestly stating that there's parts of Call of Cthulhu that look a bit dated, especially in the character models and a lot of the voice acting that is pretty rough, some of it coming across as more of a caricature than a person. Oddly enough though, I don't really have too much of a problem with that since that's something that I would do running a tabletop version of any game, and it's basically do goofy ass voices for most of the NPCs. But the character models on the other hand could use some work. A lot of them aren't really that bad and just need a little bit of touching up, but that's what you get when you have a smaller developer try and develop such an ambitious project. So if you want to take a gander at Call of Cthulhu, then I would make sure to go into it knowing what you're going to get and realize that despite how it advertises itself, it's not quite a AAA production. And despite its looks, you actually got a really nice compelling game for somebody like myself that's really invested into the Cthulhu mythos. If you ever played the Call of Cthulhu game from 2006, Dark Corners of the Earth, and wondered what it would be like if they made a game that was basically that first section when you're in Innsmouth, doing a whole lot of investigating and stuff, and then you'll be happy to know that 2018's Call of Cthulhu is just that. A whole lot of investigating and stuff. And while there are not as many crazy standout moments, the soundtrack does a nice job of creating this dreary, solemn atmosphere that follows you throughout the game, and is really typical of a great Cthulhu Mythos adventure. So that's basically what I would do to describe Call of Cthulhu, as a great attempt at a genre that's basically usually abused, and if you're looking to do a little bit of investigating the Cthulhu Mythos, then look no further than Call of Cthulhu. I have seen the dark universe longing. The gods pity the man who in his callousness can remain sane to the hideous ah! end. Sanity is a curse. Madness offers the only freedom. Commander Claw 
Squad Wallace. Squad E. The Imperial forces are on the move, heading for your position. Ready to engage. We have to unite as one. Otherwise, we'll never make it across the ice. We can do this. They're in range. Commencing counterattack. Die! So at number 4 we got ourselves the long awaited Valkyria Chronicles 4, developed by the wonderfully goofy old Sega. And with this game more than others we're gonna need a little bit of context. Man, Valkyria Chronicles 4. This game for lack of a better word feels like going back into a time machine and winding the clock like back 10 years, only to have a young Tom pick up a copy of a weird anime looking World War 2 game. I had it recommended to me by a good friend on the basis that, dude, it's like Battalion Wars but a little different and the graphics are better. So I took the usual family trip to the nearest blockbuster to go look for this Valkyria Chronicles, which I misremembered as Valkyria Wars and set out to look for it in the store. Eventually I did end up finding the copy over in Blockbuster, and you could tell how old it is from the Spider-Man 3 logo font that's on the side. I was supposed to have it for this shot, but it's being borrowed by a friend by now, but uh... Back then I figured out it was for PS3 and not the Xbox, and I was like, oops, eh, I guess I can't play it. Years later, I did some work for a family member creating a website and running various IT duties for a homegrown company. A great position for a student just outside of college, or in my case, just finished the first semester. The location for this job was way up north from my hometown, and my accommodations were a classy yet equally greasy motorhome that had all I needed, which amounted to an extension cord that ran from the house over to the motorhome and into the bedroom where I had a TV, a recently acquired PS3, and a load of games that I had acquired. Some of the fine selection were Demon Souls, Tales of Exilia, and lastly the long-awaited Valkyria Chronicles. A sum merrily threw that baby in and was introduced to a game that was unlike any other, both in its style of gameplay, the beautifully crafted watercolor aesthetic mixed in with the anime inspired designs, and its willingness to tell a fantastical but at many points a really grounded story that's basically a proxy for the second world war. Valkyria Chronicles told this sweeping story of a squad that at first constantly butt heads with each other but through the fires of war, sacrifice, and redemption brought them together like a family and when you lost some of the characters along the way and give you a hard punch in the gut. It told you to your face that this is what conflict is like and it's not as pretty or as idyllic as some of us would like to expect. But on the other hand, it took the time and emphasized that even with the destruction of war around us, there's beauty in the world and there's beauty in humanity, camaraderie, and the genuine love we hold for each other. Valkyria took the gamble of trying to present this world through this ambitious, niche war game that ultimately didn't live up to the standards that Sega wanted, so the Valkyria Chronicles franchise went into a state of decline of sorts. The game got incredibly infamous sequels on the PSP that nobody barely played that succumbed to a lot of the more outlandish anime trappings, followed by the just as awful Valkyria Azure Revolution that just made me scratch my head by how lackluster it was, but thankfully it wasn't part of the main series. And finally here we are in 2018 and finally getting the sequel that we got for Valkyria and Valkyria Chronicles 4 and man, holy whoo. What a time trip it is. When I say this game feels like it takes me back, oh boy, I mean that both figuratively and literally, since it doesn't just feel like a long lost Valkyria game, it also kinda plays like it. Which makes an immense amount of sense when you end up figuring out that Valkyria 4 was designed that way, a soft reboot of sorts. It brings back the same old mechanics, a highly updated canvas engine, and similar story dynamics. To start off, we play the role of one Claude Wallace, who's first lieutenant, or first lieutenant if you're part of the Anglosphere, and commander of Platoon E, and direct overseer by way of tank commander of Squad E, who provides us as the main band of goons that we'll be playing around with. Similar to the first Valkyria, all the main cast come from the same town from nowhere else but Gallia, the nation where the first game takes place in. Though the difference is, is that this time, instead of a desperate defense of the homeland, this crew joins the military of the Federation, which is basically this world's proxy of the Allies from the Second World War. 
That means that instead of being on the defensive, good chunks of the game will have Squad E on the offensive as the Federation attempts to defeat the Eastern European Empire, which is our proxy for the Axis powers. This offensive basically amounts to a huge operation known as Operation Northern Cross, with the objective of flanking the entire main front, creating a second front, and head directly and capture the Empire's capital of Schwarzgrad, which is very German and Russian, so I don't know, Grushin I guess. The real world equivalent of this operation is a mixture of Operation Barbarossa and the Finnish Winter War which pit the Germans and the Finns against the Bolsheviks. If you know your history, you'll know that this Operation Northern Cross ain't gonna be a piece of cake, and you'll probably lose a few people along the way. But of course, before we can go into detail about how people can have horrible, agonizing deaths in a war, we gotta talk about the game mechanics first. To start, the game is presented within the confines of a literal storybook with chapters, side chapters, and other indexes showcasing the more rudimentary elements of the game. Each chapter usually starts with the gist of that chapter's story, showing what's going on with the squad, what's happening with the story at large, and eventually running into the conflict of that chapter. Once we reach the conflict, we're given a combat mission that usually have some very specific objectives, whether that be retreating from pursuing forces, reaching a certain point in time, or conquering the enemy's base to stop reinforcements. The classes range from weak but nimble scouts, to slow and strong assault goons with submachine guns, to scaling up the tanks, APCs, and the anti-tank units to stop them. It's the right selection of units during an engagement that will make or break the offensive, so be sure to deploy the right ones at the beginning. But if you deploy some real stinkers, then you can always make them retreat at the local camp and deploy something else during the mission. From there, the game is sort of this quasi-turn-based state where the larger picture plays out like a normal tactics game, but when you select a unit, you actually play as it, moving in the same way as any character in a third-person shooter, albeit a bit more clunky. You move your character around the battlefield for a specific amount of movement shown by the bar at the bottom. When the bar runs out, they can't move no longer. This then ties into the actions that your characters can do. It can be shooting an enemy soldier, healing a fellow soldier with Ragnade, or fixing up the Hoffen which is the tank that Claude commands. But whatever you do, make sure that move counts because you only have a set amount of moves before the turn is over and it's time for the Empire to counter your move, to which the AI will go through the same process that you did. At first, this is all going to seem pretty complicated, but the longer you play into the game, the more these mechanics come as second nature, and you're going to need them because the later missions in the game become incredibly difficult and require a lot of time for you to go through. Valkyria's story is special because from the outer shell, it seems like you're a typical sappy anime love story with the backdrop of a world war, but the more you dig in, the more it surprises you. Like Nino Kuni 2, Valkyria has this incredible ability to treat the player like an adult and give you some goddamn hard punches to the stomach, whether it be crippling despair that comes from fighting in a prolonged conflict, the long-lasting PTSD that people, real people, have to deal with every day, and most important of all, learning how to say goodbye to those you love and even take responsibility for your actions. There are moments in Valkyria 4 that make you go, yeah man, oh that's sweet, that seems like an awesome idea, let's go and play the hero and do this little side operation, only to hit you with the bitter reality that you're not necessarily the hero or the protagonist of this war. You're not special, you're not the chosen one, well it's if, if you're me. You're just a crucial piece of the overall picture and you have to play your role in it otherwise people counting on you will die. And once you start to get that into your head, you'll start to see everyone become these killing machines that make up the larger cogs of the war. But even then, Valkyria 4 puts it into perspective why these actions matter to you and why it's such a big deal when someone dies, because the game takes the time to show some of the beauty that comes from the conflict, which are the genuine love for our fellow man and the bonds we create along the way that keep them all functioning. So if there's one thing that Valkyria does better than a lot of its contemporaries, it's putting war as a whole into perspective. The incredible amounts of horror and despair, but also the love you can have for your comrade that makes you get through some of the wars that a human can go through. Ultimately, Valkyria 4 does the one thing that I thought was impossible, and that's revive and revitalize a series that I've been waiting over a decade to play. I really do mean it when it feels like a long lost sequel. It somehow does new things while taking me back to that crazy summer years ago, stuck in a motorhome with a PS3 in my sweet ass time. 
My hopes are high for the future of the franchise. Hopefully Sega has made enough money to continue it in interesting and unique ways, but whenever the next game comes out, I'll be eagerly waiting. So folks, if you're looking for a wonderful turn-based tactics game in the year of our Lord 2019, then look no further than Valkyria Chronicles 4. Time to end this shrew. Eyes up! I'll do my part if you promise to do yours. There. All set for the next battle. I know I'm not worthy of this responsibility. Hold there do I see my mother. Hold there do I see my father. Hold there do they call to me. Hold there do they call to me. Hold there do they call to me. That bow is a little big for you, isn't it? My mother made it for me. Said I'd grow into it. Find your way home. You are free. We're taking our ashes to the highest peak in the realms. Ashes? It was our last wish. Where must we go? To a realm beyond your own. There's only one person who can get you where you need to go. They call me Mamiya! Smartest man alive. First, you need to cut off my head. Wait, what? That axe you got. You gotta handle her special. I know you're a god. Not of this realm, but there's no mistaking it. He doesn't know, does he? About your true nature? Or his own? The longer you wait, the more damage you do. He will resent you, and you may lose him forever. You're next! I'll rip your head off! There are consequences to killing a god! Why? How do you know? How do you know? Power. This weapon. Fellas, you ever ask yourself, man, I sure wish there were some AAA games out there that were actually, you know, not ass and kind of worth your time? And fellas, I gotta say, I do have a game for you, but I'm just saying, this one ain't Japanese for once, okay? Because, of course, I'm talking about 2018's God of War. First, I gotta explain that one of the reasons why this video is coming in so late is because I promised myself that I had one last game to run through before I could finish compiling my list for the year, and boy, am I glad that I got a chance to play God of War. God of War, developed by Sony Santa Monica and Cody Wyoming, is the latest iteration in a soft reboot to God of War, and tells the story of Kratos' warpath in a new land, this time in Nordic mythology inspired Midgard and the surrounding realms. This time around, we got some new changes from how the camera angle and the combat works to the overall plot and theme to the game that will obviously come with not just a new generation of consoles, but also a new generation of God of War. Instead of this giant sweeping tale of how Kratos is going to get back at the Greek gods for forcing him to murder his wife and daughter to become the new god of war, we got a more grounded and personal story for Kratos and his son Atreus, colloquially known as Boar. But before we get ourselves full on the nice good old meat and potatoes of this game, let's talk about probably my least favorite part of this game, and that's of course the gameplay. But, ain't saying it's bad. Every time Sony seems to release one of their award bait games, they all look like this. Over the shoulder third person cinema mode game. And with most of these games, it feels like with every new iteration there's less and less game. It's just slowly becoming some sort of movie and to be honest, some awful ones at that if we're starting to compare this stuff to cinema. But fellas, there's a caveat to all this and that's the fact that God of War has the best gameplay out of all of these Sony movie games by a long shot. Yeah, sure, the perspective God of War plays out in isn't really any different from the rest of those games, but the moment-to-moment -moment combat gameplay to some degree actually requires a tactile response from the player, and depending on what difficulty you're playing it in, can actually pose a challenge. 
Unlike its predecessors, the combat takes a much more slow and deliberate pace. You'll be fighting smaller but more intimate groups of enemies that you really gotta focus your dodges, blocks, and parries on to correctly make it out of a fight. Your main weapon will be this game's signature Dentine Ice Axe that can freeze enemies in place and come back at you with a beck and call. The axe's attacks are slower, stronger, and tend to be focused on a singular enemy until you upgrade it for some truly devastating results. One of the other weapons at your disposal is the shield that you use to block, and if done at the perfect moment, can cause a righteous parry that will give you a split second to cause a lot of damage. We also have Atreus that can help you out with his bow, shooting at random goons and eventually causing damage with his cool knife and spirit animals after you take the peace pipe to the Beyond Realm. But a key thing you might have caught that I mentioned with all the weapons is that they become more impressive after you upgrade them. Because in this latest installment of God of War, we have numerous RPG systems in place that you can use to customize your weapons and armor to do a variety of different things. It can range from making your armor more resistant to fire weapons, to allowing your axes to build up more rage so you can go into a goofy Spartan boy lover rage and rip snow juggalos with your bare hands. And you're going to be going through a lot of juggalos because the story this game takes you through, my god, it's going to net you a bunch of dead goons. Ah, now to go on to probably my favorite part of the new God of War, and that is its change in direction when it comes to the story from its predecessors. While I thoroughly enjoyed some of the prior games in the series, and they definitely do hold their own weight, the primary driving force for the first trilogy is basically Zeus man bad and you gotta go kill him. God of War 2018 on the other hand goes for a more grounded and honestly more emotional setup for its story, which can amount to taking Kratos' wife's ashes to the highest peak in the realms while having Kratos teaching his son Atreus how to become a man. The road to the end is long and treacherous, so you'll get to see Kratos as his broken man who has lost again one of his loved ones, and go through the task of surviving, teaches Atreus how to survive, and all under the weight of his sorrow. And to be honest, the feels throughout the game hit me pretty hard in a few spots. While I have no child myself to care for, I can empathize with Kratos on the task that he's been burdened with. It genuinely brings about a new face to what would have been a tired cliché of a character if they had just gone with some more Odin Man bad plot to get you globe hopping and killing a bunch of the Aesir gods. You're gonna feel refreshed when the real climax to our story is not some ridiculous fight with Thor where you're throwing giant boulders at each other all in an attempt to splat his brains or something. Instead, we get this really down-to-earth, intimate end to this game that made me feel fulfilled. I'm honestly surprised that a God of War game, of all things, ended up making it so high on this damn list. To cap off briefly, one of the other elements I really love, which is Santa Monica's soundtrack for this game. All the amounts of the BOM 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 that really like nails down the weight and power of Kratos. God damn is it good. But all in all, God of War is one of the few Sony exclusives from last year that is actually 100% worth all the time. And you should honestly go out and play it, and it's been one of my favorite AAA experiences in a long time. This weapon, any weapon, comes from here. But only when tempered by this, I discipline the self-control of the one who wields it. We need your help! This is no ordinary illness. The boy's true nature, your true nature, fights within him. So I'm a man now. Like you? No. We are not men. We are more than that. The responsibility is far greater. something that big? Kakugo-Eka, Nembutsu-demo-tonai-to-ke-wa-shimono-hore-ta-onna-no-mae-de-koku-ni-sareta-mama-jin. Oi. Nanji! 
あまり時間がねえ早いとこ済ませてんだがな行くぞあそう。Two years in a row. At this point, I don't even think I need to go super in depth to set up the stories for these ones. Because, as usual, you play the role of Kazuma Kiryu, the former Jakuza goon who, through the course of the last six games, and if you count the prequel of Jakuza Zero, the last seven games, dealing with the many shysters of the underbelly of Japan. You've gone from avenging the deaths of countless friends to getting your boy Akiyama out of trouble, finding Majima in the sewers or something, but we've never had Kazuma go through what we had to do in this latest adventure, and that is take care of his newly born grandson. Man, this is like the second game in the row where a central plot for the game is looking after your own kin. Except this time around, you don't have baby Haruto killing like Draugr with his super bow. Well, let's talk about what you do in this game because holy hell, there is a lot of things to do in this damn game. For starters, Jakuza is mostly, and I say that with heavy quotations, an action adventure RPG that has combat like a beat em up where you'll be fighting throughout the course of the game an endless amount of Japanese and Chinese triad goons. With every fight, you'll gain experience to upgrade several different characteristics of Kazuma, whether it be upgrading his vital stats like health and stamina, or upgrading little things like how much stamina you get from eating food, or taking more lunch money from the goons you beat up. Though I gotta say that my favorite one is probably increasing your alcohol tolerance to the level of a normal Southeast Asian, so you can slug back more beers to fight bigger and badder goons. And believe me, fellas, you're gonna need all the damn upgrades you can get in this game, because if there is ever one thing I've learned from using violence to take what I want, is that the more dead goons that I can beat up and the more money I can steal from them, the more I can use it in karaoke. That's right, fellas, it wouldn't be a goddamn Jacuzzi game if there wasn't an endless sea of mini games to sink countless useless hours into. Ranging from going to the cabaret club to pick up women to also going online to, you know, pick up women. Working the cabaret club has been a staple for Jacuzzi games for a while and basically amounts to saying the right things to impress women. So, kind of like real life, except real life doesn't give you these goofy ass conversation cards to lead the conversation in one way or another. But just like real life, be sure to butter her up with some booze before you go in for the kill to greatly increase your chances. The other mini game I mentioned is going to a live chat parlor so you can hop on the computer thingy or whatever and talk to some real live women in some sort of Omegle ass program, where you and a bunch of other creeps try to butter up an e thought. Though the key with this mini game is the fact that Kazuma, being in his 50s, causes some issues typing on a keyboard, so what you have to do to succeed is run through a sort of quick time event sequence where you manually press the keys with a single finger before the opportunity to say something really cool passes. One of the things I find hilarious with this mini game is that they got some real ass jav idols to do their typical livestream stuff and strip off their goofy clothes. Now, how I know that these are real jav idols, I don't know, so don't ask me. Though I gotta say, for some of the more, yeah, let's say sensitive individuals in our program, you might want to skip these damn mini games. I, I wrote a blog post a while ago about why I fing hate video games. Because this is what it does, it appeals to like the male fantasy. But of course, we can't forget my favorite damn mini game for this series, and you probably already guessed it. <laughs> Great. 
My only regret with Jakuza 6 as of right now is the fact that it doesn't have the goddamn disco mini game from Jakuza 0 because with that mini game, man, I had double the amount of rhythm mini game action that I got in one game. So of course I'm gonna go on about and how great the story is, but guys, come on, seriously. The journey you'll go through to see the conclusion of Kazuma Saga is not just a genuine tearjerker, but is such a fitting end to a franchise that I've known to grow and love over the course of the last 10 years. In Jakuza 6, you'll be taking Kazuma and his newly found grandson Haruto on a journey to find the father, which will take him from the busy streets of Kamurocho to the sleepy, quiet shipbuilding town in Hiroshima that like most things in Jakuza 6 is a way to tone down the excess for some of the best storytelling in the series. In Hiroshima you'll come across a gang of goons turned friends and allies that are there in the quest to find baby Haruto's father, and man, what a lovable band of goons they are. Our main man for the squad is Tsuyoshi Nagumo, a man who immediately becomes jealous of Kazuma because the woman and particularly his love interest, Kiyomi, tends to love taking care of the baby. But like the real world, he'll turn into a friend after you beat the hell out of him enough times and show his other goons how much of a great aniki you are to the entire Hidose family who are made up of orphans. The second of the goons is Yuta Usami, who's the youngest out of all of them, but just like the rest of the Hirose gang has a lot of heart to offer and makes for a fantastic friend to take on errands with. Finally, we have the remaining two goons that take a much smaller role but nonetheless make for a complete team in the Ovoid Tagashida and the gruff looking Matsunaga, who both have some wonderful moments with Kazuma. But what is a Jakuza family without the family man to lead the role? And my god, fellas, we got ourselves a special guest to be the family man of the Jakuza. The big man that runs the Hirose family is none other than Toru Hirose, an ancient Japanese man played by the equally ancient and legendary Takeshi Kitano, also known as Beat Takeshi. If you think that Kitano's face seems familiar even to someone that isn't well versed in Japanese cinema, then that's because Kitano is one of the most famous for not just the huge laundry list of films he starred in, but the numerous comedy shows that he's hosted, most prominent of which is Takeshi's Castle, a show where contestants go through a series of increasingly absurd and elaborate obstacles to make it to the end and win the grand prize. But if you don't seem to recognize the name Takeshi's Castle, then for a western audience you might recognize it as the name of MXC, which was genuinely awful but wonderfully absurd redub of the entire show to pit two opposing teams against each other. Usually those teams had a wacky name, kinda like being gamers against the porn industry or something like that. So it was really a pleasant surprise to see Takeshi make an appearance for the final game, since his performance as Toru was probably my favorite in the entire game. But not just Toru as the rest of the Hirose family really adds a much more smaller scale yet focused approach to the story. I can basically describe it as another one of those games where by the end of it I was really missing these characters and their lovable antics. But with the ending that we got, man, you know what, it was all worth it. In the end, Jakuza 6 is almost a hard game to recommend for those that haven't enjoyed the entire saga, because if I were you, I would go through and play all the games before you get to this point so you can fully enjoy the experience like I did. Alrighty fellas, I'm gonna have to level with you, and I can't really help but feel melancholic for Jakuza. Even though Jakuza 6 is such a wonderful sellout, this is one of the few Sega franchises that's really gonna hurt to say goodbye to. But. Like with all things in life, we gotta say goodbye to it eventually, and the goodbye that Kazuma has in Jakuza 6, A Song of Life, is the best one that he could possibly get. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah,
course, before we reach the number one spot, there are a few games I do want to have a few honorable mentions about. It's not that they're bad, because, come on, really? Come on, guys. Like, it's honestly the opposite. The thing is, is that they just weren't good enough to be on this list, and there were honestly much better games. To start off, we got good old Spider-Man from Sony. That is, it's such a good game. It's so genuinely well done. My only real gripe, and that's the gripe with myself, is that I didn't have the time to finish it, which I really should have. Another game that we have on this list is Kingdom Come Deliverance. Had a rocky start at first with a lot of its bugs and goofy glitches, but over time it's become quite a fun, faithful medieval game. One of the last ones here is going to be Warhammer Stinky Tide 2, which is a lot of fun to have with friends. If you've been wanting to play like Left 4 Dead 2 again and go through missions and go eh, kill a bunch of rats and chaos goons, then come on, like, load up Vermintide 2, stick it in the computing thing, send me a message, we'll be there this Saturday. And of course, the last game that we're going to talk about today is the faithful recreation of this bad boy right here. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, Battletech, man. Oh, man, game is so good. But god damn, it has one critical flaw, and it's it's just not optimized enough. When you have a game that's so wonderful, so faithfully recreates this bad boy with all its rules and logistics and weapons and mechs, and then you have awful coding and crap to make it just run like ass, then it's just not going to pop in the top ten, but it's so close. I think they fixed it by now with a lot of like patches, but... Either or, either way, give this game a look. Well, yeah, of course, give the ba give the board game a look because it's wonderful. But give Battletech on PC a look because, goddamn, it's pretty good. But so, without any further delay, let's get to the number one spot because, man, fellas, you're probably wondering, hey, when's this really going to get done? While this isn't like the Nier Automata CD, because I don't have it this year, I actually do have the vinyl soundtrack of the game that we're going to talk about this year, because not just its soundtrack, but its gameplay and its story elements are so profound and impactful, and have honestly, to a lot of people I know, have changed their lives, and I'm of course talking about the wonderful Celeste. Celeste, from the get-go, was what I can honestly describe as the single-stage platformer perfected. Not enhanced, not made a little bit better with a little bit of wacky mechanics. I mean perfected. But of course, for the fellas out there that don't understand what the single-stage platformer is, just look to games like Mega Man and most prominently Super Schmeet Boy, since it's not just the closest in style, but also in difficulty in progression. Essentially, you have the single screen that you'll want to get across and reach the goal at the end. But in your way, there's a whole slew of hazards that are placed there to make sure that you won't make it. For a lot of these screens, you will have to do them over numerous times since they're not just challenging, but require you to do them in a single near flawless run for the most part. Now with games like Super Schmeet Boy and Mega Man, they always left me with something wanting. For one, it could be something to the vein of gameplay is tight as hell, but the story could be a bit lacking. Or the gameplay and story was decent, but the presentation left a little to be desired. But the wonderful fellas at Matt Makes Games came in early, rose up early in 2018 and brought us Celeste. And it comes out swinging full, knowing full well what it wanted to do, and it nails every aspect. Now, usually at this part, we go like, hey, yo, now we're gonna talk about the gameplay first, but nah, let's talk about the premise and get that out of the way. 
In Celeste, you're going to be playing a girl named Madeline from the Great White North, which makes sense since the game takes place in the real-life location of Celeste Mountain over in British Columbia. Though I don't think that the one in BC has things like a ruined city, a ruined castle, a ruined hotel, and yeah, you guessed it folks, a fully working cable car. Using sheer willpower and determination, Madeline sets out to fulfill the personal goal of climbing Celeste Mountain for herself, to find fulfillment in life, and while we get to the details of that later, let's get on with how the game plays, and holy hell dude, I cannot emphasize how tight this damn game is. Like your typical 2D platformer, you move from one side to the other and can jump, but while a lot of games go for a double jump, Celeste forgoes that and gives you a one-time dash that will fling you to where you need to go. Now the distinction of it being a one-time dash is important, because the fact that you can only do it once is a huge key to many of the challenges that you'll face screen to screen. You can also use the environment in a variety of ways, whether it be hanging on the wall to check where you're going to drop to next, using a poofy clown to give you an extra bit of jump and oomph in the air, or using the feather to soar through the air for a limited amount of time. And be sure to know how Madeline and the environment works, because there will be an equal amount of environmental hazards that will impede your progress. Ranging from the pitfalls, spikes, ghastly areas filled with ectoplasm, or even a physical manifestation of your anxiety and depression. Though it's not that every single level you play through gives you a new mechanic or a new gimmick for you to play with that makes it so exciting, it's what Celeste does with it and in unique ways. Man, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say every single pixel in this damn game was artfully and like a film director deliberately placed there. Now of course you could say that's obvious since it was designed from the ground up by people, but there haven't been many platformers where it feels like a genius developed every single level. I cannot stress enough how things like how the obstacles and environmental effects are placed and spaced apart from each other to feel so genuinely and positively challenging, yet at the same time possible, giving you this feeling of absolute mastery by the time you get to the end of the game. It's not just what the game throws at you, but how the challenges and stage gimmicks require more and more out of you as time goes on, and this isn't a steep cliff to face. This feels like a perfect graduation from the simple stuff in the first stage to putting everything you learned into the final stages. And personally, that's really key that the graduation is so subtle yet perfect. You never ever really feel like you have it mastered, but when you complete a particularly difficult screen or sequence and then beat the level, the feeling of accomplishment is something that is just sublime. It's just crazy to think that so many wonderful aspects of all these other games that I love all congeal together into one product and perfect it in Celeste to make it into a wonderful, brilliant platforming game. But if we're going to talk about something else that's brilliant, then we got to talk about, of course, this game's impactful, profound story. As I stated earlier, Celeste at its core is about climbing a mountain, and most should know that there is a genuine challenge and danger in scaling such an imposing natural structure. But a lot of times, people don't tend to talk about the genuine mental and spiritual feats that are required to do such a task. Celeste takes us through that spiritual and mental journey, showcasing the world and mind of a battered girl rife with the ails of insecurity, anxiety, and depression. At the center of our story, we got Madeline, a girl that we can positively say has, has some problems going on for her, since it's insinuated that she just left a relationship behind and is looking to clear her mind and find something fulfilling, like Climb Celeste Mountain. Right away, we figure out that not everything is quite right with Celeste Mountain. The battered driveway coming up to the trail is destroyed and well battered, to the forsaken city that is impossibly abandoned and makes for some strange land, almost something like out of a Team Ico game. But we at least have some other people along the mountain trail, like the smooth, not like the other hipsters hailing from the land of Seattle, hipster Theo, or the woman we met at first who seems like a crazy old bat, an unthreatening bat, but a crazy old bat nonetheless. There's honestly a few more characters along the way that I would love to talk about, but honestly fellas, that would be spoiling it, and you people, you gotta go out and play this game. Now not everything on your journey is there to help you out, because there's a few things that are there to hinder your progress. 
a lot of it being the environmental hazards that plague the mountain like pitfalls, spikes, and hurricane force winds higher up on the mountain, but the one thing that will hinder the mountain climb the most to Madeline is none other than herself. When going through a grave endeavor like climbing a mountain, especially one like Celeste Mountain, you have to have a stable mind and nerves made of steel. But it so happens that her character Madeline has none of those things, but that does make for a compelling narrative. We take a story that's very man against nature and we turn it on its head and make it about man against self, and it gives us an introspective look at ourselves. Not everyone in the world is a crazy talented mountaineer with decades of going to expeditions to the most dangerous peaks. The fact of the matter is that most of us are just normal schmoes that one day for one reason or another decided to scale a mountain for the betterment of self. Because this ain't a story about people succumbing to what ails them, it's a story about what it takes to make the best with what you have and improve on yourself. Taking something that cripples ordinary folks like anxiety and depression and changing it for the better and overcoming it. But just like others can't climb the mountain on your behalf, change has to start with you and it has to come from within. Now this is at the core of why I love Celeste so damn much. Because it takes something like wonderful great platforming gameplay and a beautiful profound story and just mixes them together into a beautiful unity. The message that the fellas at Matt Makes Games is one that we should all not just experience, but take to heart because it's a message that both smacks sense into you, and then when you got your bearings, encourages you through positive reinforcement to become better. Each one of us needs to make the climb to get where we want to be in life, and it ain't going to be the easiest thing we've ever endeavored for. So we need to take a step back and look at ourselves and see what we want to change and how we want to do it. Because to be perfectly honest fellas, this is probably the game that has prevented me from doing more videos, but on the other hand, has gotten a lot of my life back in order. While I wouldn't say it's the number one factor, Celeste has actually helped me in ways by trying to further my career and do things, giving me the willpower and the strength to carry on so I can get a new job, get better work, get better money so I can do things like get better schooling so I can further my career and in information security. And that's really why I haven't been doing too many videos lately. But of course, we'll talk about this after this segment is done. Let's of course go back to Celeste. So fellas, let's cap off Celeste by giving a huge shout out to the queen who gave us my single favorite part of Celeste's presentation, and that is of course the wonderfully composed soundtrack done by Lena Rain. Every single track in this game from the prologue to the track that marks the credits for the game is one giant musical adventure going on in your ears that becomes a definitive character in the game itself. Each track is layered with the motifs of that certain level, starting off at a more subtle and almost mysterious vibe that gets you curious, only for it to open up completely in a whole new dynamic way to coincide with the level itself becoming more complex and dynamic. A really good example of this is in Resurrections, which is the track that plays in the Ruined Castle. It starts off with these quiet synth arpeggios only for it to rise into a flurry of percussion and more dynamic synth tunes. Another motif I really love is that throughout the game there's this motif that's specific to Madeline, and so when it comes to her dealing with certain aspects of herself or the mountain, you'll see it again and again, and when you notice it, man, it's just sublime. If you want to grab this soundtrack like the rest of the ones that I've talked about, you can grab it on Lena's Bandcamp page, which will also be on the description. Hell, I love the soundtrack so much that I got it on vinyl. Don't have it with me at the moment because it's in the other location, but God damn, I listen to it on my commute pretty much every single damn day. So to conclude with Celeste for real this time, I honestly have no idea what else to say other than to stop whatever the hell you're doing and go buy this game and enjoy what it has to offer to us. Because the chances are that you're not just going to find a superb platformer, but also an incredibly beautiful and profound game that if it hits you like it did to me, it's going to last with you for years to come. And that's why I have to give Celeste as my top game of 2018.
And there we go, fellas. We've reached the end of this feature-length video. And honestly, fellas, thank you so much for making it all the way to the end if you're still watching. Because, man, I hope you had a lot of fun watching this. Because it, this was not just fun to make, it was pain in the ass to make. God damn, is this long. I gotta stop doing this. But... Let's continue. Now to continue with what I said earlier and be real with you fellas, I have changed a lot of my life around and it's becoming increasingly difficult to make videos. So while most channels go, man, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna promise to make more videos, you know, kind of like I have before, I'm gonna be honest with you and say you're kind of gonna get what you're gonna get. There's a few projects like usual that I would like to get the ball rolling on, but it all depends on what's happening. Like for example, I'm gonna be taking a trip out to Europe here pretty soon, but of course, you know, expect a video out of that goofiness. So expect a few more videos coming out this year, I'm not gonna put out a regular schedule, but you're gonna see some new games, you're gonna see some old ones, and hopefully you're gonna see some firearms videos because man, I've been talking about making them for so long now, but we'll get there eventually. So what's what's in store for 2019? Yeah, I don't know. And that's coming from the guy who runs this damn show. The only thing I could tell you is, fellas, just keep watching and let's see where it comes out because this is Tom the Chosen One. I'm going to see you fellas next time.